Today, we begin a special series on the Brentwood Academy podcast by highlighting the implementation of Portrait of a Graduate at BA. Together, Headmaster Kurt Masters and Dean of Academics Josh Davis share more about the concept which incorporates five key characteristics of a Brentwood Academy graduate. These include resilient, critical thinker, thoughtful communicator, problem solver, and Christ follower. In this series, Mr. Masters will feature BA faculty members who will share more about each of the five characteristics. Let's get started with this introduction to Portrait of a Graduate. Josh, we've had a lot of conversations over the last year about a portrait of a graduate. I think of the mission and ministry of Brentwood Academy, and we talk about that mission statement, that one sentence summary so often, Brentwood Academy's co-ed, independent, college preparatory school, dedicated to nurturing and challenging each whole person, body, mind, and spirit, to the glory of God. We talk about that as a one sentence summary of a target, paint it on the wall, let everyone get a clear look at that. But as we think about hitting that target, much of the conversation, and you've had a good part in leading those conversations around Portrait of a Graduate, has been to try to articulate what does it look like when we hit that target, living out that mission and ministry to the glory of God. Talk a little bit about the reason for why we might want to capture five key characteristics of what we're looking for uh, to show that we're hitting that target. Yeah, such an important question because if we're dedicated to something, if we want to carry out our mission, we have to know mm-hmm. where we're going. Wh- what is that end? Mm-hmm. And our mission statement helps us do that, but it, it's all predicated on, on leading students towards a particular place. So we want to be able to understand as we think about each aspect of the mission statement, how do we get there? What does that look like? Right. And especially as we bring students in that culminating event mm-hmm. and have them walk across the stage, what should we know about them? And it, it's been fascinating really exploring this and asking hard questions and saying, what is it that we've been doing for a long time as BA, long and storied tradition, and what is it that we want to do aspirationally? And what we've done is we've had a series of conversations uh, with a lot of different groups in order to be able to coalesce those two pieces. What's happened in the past and where do we want to go in order to live out our mission? And this metaphor, you know, you talked about the target, um, you know, like, what are we aiming for? Well, this metaphor of like, well, what's that portrait? Like, if we're going to paint a portrait and put it up on the wall, Mm -hmm. what should we look for? And what's really most important? And it's not, sometimes portrait might be challenging because it seems singular, but this is a, a generalized understanding of like, what do we want out of our students? What should they all possess? What are the characteristics that they have that we're saying is most important to us as an institution that aligns well with our mission. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about it, but we've, we've met with a whole group of people. We've actually met with five different groups of stakeholders in order to try to understand what is it that they've been thinking? What is it that they've experienced? So we, we started um, with parents, asking them really important questions. Uh, many of whom were also alum, which is another group, kind of as these target audience and saying, hey, what, what do you think about when your student walks across that stage? What is it that you want? And I, I still remember in one of those meetings, uh, we were sitting in the fine arts lobby, and, and I think it was you, you were saying, like, is it really that you, you want your child to know this particular thing? And uniformly, parents were saying, no, it's not a particular knowledge. It's more who they become. And, and actually, um, well, we could talk about each of these different stake, mm-hmm. these different um, groups. But parents, um, alum, we met with the Alumni Council and asked them, what was your experience at BA? What were the things that stood out from you? When you think about your experience at BA, who have you become because you went through BA for mm-hmm. seven, four years, whatever it might be? Um, we spent time talking with teachers, uh, with administrators, um, and then, of course, with students, asking the students, um, we spent some time talking with seniors uh, last year, saying, what's been your experience? Who have you become as a result of this? What, did you, what have you hoped to receive and what have you received from BA? And we just took all these, these adjectives, these descriptors, these characteristics that all five of these groups gave us in order to be able to explore 
this larger question of what have we done and where do we want to go? And then we've had lots of conversations with different other groups, committees saying, okay, how do we take these and coalesce these into these five guiding mm-hmm. ideas? I think taking those different groups and the experiences they've had, the experiences they're in right now, reflecting and looking at the trends and patterns that emerge well after the fact, all contribute to a realistic expression of things that actually connect to what goes on here, but also paint a picture of what we're reaching for that we haven't yet attained. And I think that's one of the great things about the mission statement, that it applies to all of us, adults as well as students, parents as well as the kids who come here in sixth grade, that the idea that God's growing us by drawing us closer to him through the different challenges we face, through the support and encouragement that we get. And so that aspirational piece of these characteristics, not that we've already attained all of this, or that our halos are straight when we walk across the the stage at graduation, but God at work develops Mm -hmm. character Mm -hmm. in people by the seeds that are planted and those that water those seeds, and then by the individual choices that are made as people respond. And so just talk about the trajectory as we see our, our faculty pondering these issues and incorporating them. Some of the conversations that we've been having even at the start of this school year about how do we take advantage of the things we've learned in those prior conversations to begin to be intentional as well as to see what develops naturally. Yeah, that that intentionality is probably one of the most important pieces because we want to be able to say, if, if we're dedicated towards this, as we're thinking nurturing challenges, we're thinking body, mind, and spirit, how do, how do we pursue all these things? Well, it's not just knowledge. It's, it's these characteristics. Well, we've been doing this, but how are we now more intentional in pinpointing, recognizing them? So one of the first things we're beginning to do is just recognize what are those bright spots? What are the areas in which we're already doing this exceptionally well and that we have been doing this? Where do those emerge? And we've, we've seen some, some beautiful things. Um, we, we've talked a lot already this year about thoughtful communication and developing those thoughtful communicators. And it's mm-hmm. like, where do we already see that? Um, we hear consistently about our English department and how they help our students become better writers. But we've also been leaning into this idea of seminar and allowing students to sit in an environment where they're around their peers and they're needing to, to critically think and then wrestle with tough ideas and then articulate them in, in really compelling ways. And they have to do it on their feet. Like the, and so this becomes one of these areas where we're looking, talking with teacher and saying, hey, where's this already happening? How can we begin to recognize the beauty of the work that we're doing? And then how do we dovetail off that? If we see this, and this is where our, our history and social science departments picking up on this with seminar and saying, oh, we see great things in the English department, what we're doing. How do we carry this over with the work we're doing with documents and analysis and allowing students to provide this opportunities mm-hmm. to be thoughtful communicators? They're doing some problem solving there as they, they look at different things. They're doing the critical analysis, and now how do we articulate this? Oh, if we use the language from what English is doing, how can we incorporate that within our department as well? So we're, we're beginning to see these, these opportunities as we pinpoint these specific characteristics to be able to say, oh, this is how we can pursue this more effectively because we've now named it. Mm-hmm. And, and because we're trying to inculcate this, vertically six through 12 and horizontally cross departmentally within mm-hmm. grades how can we find those areas where it's like oh this is where it's working well let's utilize this in order to make it happen mm-hmm. this was happening in some ways uh, naturally just as teachers our teachers are excellent but now that we've named it mm-hmm. we're able to see the way in which we can much more cohesively and purposefully um, intentionally mm-hmm. as you mentioned lead towards these same ends. Mm-hmm. When you talk about leading toward these ends, I think of the image of the spiral curriculum where exactly. uh, yep. we reinforce in seventh grade what was learned in sixth. We're building in sixth grade off of what students brought from other schools before coming here and all the way up through graduation. Along with that spiral, spiral curriculum, we look at the fabric of BA. We talk about the triangle philosophy and body, mind, and spirit as three sides of a triangle, but when we express that, we talk about the fabric and how it's interwoven. And so in both of those metaphors, the spiral 
where we come back to the principles and reinforce them at different levels of growth and the idea that the different parts reinforce each other. So it's not athletics standing alone. Mm -hmm. It's athletics woven Mm -hmm. through who we are with our body, how intentional we are at developing our spirit, how intentional we are about developing the intellect. It's happening all the time in every setting. And so talk a little bit about how these parts and pieces are interwoven and how recognizing those threads as being woven through the fabric of BA contribute to the ability to strengthen those parts and pieces and the collaboration that grows out of it. Yeah, I love that. because, And I think this is one of the strengths of the portrait of a graduate. As we're saying, this is what we want. It's not just the things that students know mm-hmm. or even do, but who they become. And this is what we believe fundamentally as Christians, right? Mm-hmm. We want somebody to become more an image of Christ. They, they're made in the image of God, but then how do you live that out? What does that look like? Well, that's not just the knowledge of the periodic table or not just the knowledge of how to write well, but it is the inculcation and, and the synthesis of all these different pieces together. So body, mind, and spirit, well, where do, where do these characteristics manifest themselves? Mm-hmm. Well, we're going into this robotics tournament, right, this weekend, and we, we see it there. They're, they're building, they're solving all these problems, this sort of thing, then they're presenting, they have to... <laughs> the the challenge of being on the stage when the clock's mm-hmm. going against the other team, like that sort of thing. But then that happens on our courts and our fields, you know, and, and that happens in the classroom. We see the, the way in which these things synthesize mm-hmm. because of our students having these different attributes. Like mm-hmm. they're, they're not just body, they're not just mind, they're not just spirit. It's the, it's the way in which these things play together that end up developing this more readily. So I know in future podcast sections, we're going to talk about each of the specific things, Mm -hmm. but we see the way in which these characteristics manifest themselves most readily in the, in the intersection between different aspects of life. We want our students to be critical thinkers, not just in the classroom, but then the way in which they function on the speech team and on the swim team, Mm -hmm. right? We want to see the way in which they're doing this in their art class, but then how that impacts the way in which they treat their neighbor in the classroom um, and in the hallway. Like how, how do we exhibit these sorts of characteristics mm-hmm. continually? And the more we're talking about it, everyone within our community is talking about it, the more we strive towards those and then they can begin to show up in all these different arenas. Yeah, I think that idea of having them show up, having a demonstration of what it is we're trying to develop looking at older students, looking at the leadership of their parents or other adults they trust, people who've grown in their character, who've handled adversity, people who have become kind as well as careful with their words, people who've begun to step into problems that they've seen and not just be clever at solving or bringing a solution, but willing to step in and engage an issue. Those are characteristics that they see in action. I think, as you said, naming them, calling them out, allows people to reflect about what it is that they're gaining while they're doing things that they might not have put together as part of the process of growing in those areas. I think it's, people ask, why do I need the quadratic equation? I'll never use this in life. Mm -hmm. But if you can see a purpose, you know, this great, uh, the notion that we always ought to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that lies within us, I think that's... uh, tremendously powerful in terms of our faith and having a basis for hope. But I think that same principle is if you don't have a reason for what you're doing, if you don't know why the teacher's inflicting something on you, you're less likely to throw yourself into it, to see it as worthy of your time or suffering Mm -hmm, to gain that. mm -hmm. But in these ideas that a math problem has a benefit, that it develops your ability to focus. And this idea that focusing is really what prayer is about, that focusing on God is developed through concentrating on a math problem you don't get yet, yeah. or yeah. working through a translation in a, in a language you didn't master in your childhood. Those sorts of things, connecting the parts and pieces so that students see that the real value is something richer and deeper than just the task at hand. It's sort of the comparison of athletes who are running stadiums. There's no stadium in a volleyball court. Why do I have to run stadiums? Well, there's a benefit beyond the activity or the event. And so uh, just talk about how, as we look at our student experience, how collectively the environment at Brentwood Academy, the collection of tasks 
and activities all contribute to helping to offer hope and offer an opportunity to see themselves in a certain way and then to look to grow who they are. Yeah, yeah. Just in a, a micro way, I had a conversation with a student yesterday who was wrestling with how do I balance everything? You know, where does my resilience figure out, you know, manifest itself mm-hmm. when I'm trying to do all these different things at the same time? Mm-hmm. I'm taking a really challenging academic schedule. I'm involved in the play. I'm also doing cheer, you know, like all these sorts mm-hmm. of things. You know, what are the boundaries? How do, how do I seek wisdom in this? And I love that because that was really manifest, you know, a clear manifestation of what we're trying to cultivate in the portrait Mm -hmm. because it's like we constantly see the interaction of different aspects of our lives Mm -hmm. and the end isn't just being an excellent Mm -hmm. fill in the blank, you know, academic scholar or an athlete or Mm -hmm. thespian or whatever it might be. But it's like, how do I bring all these pieces together? So what we see with these students is as they are able to think about these things that they're, they're cultivating. It's like, oh, well, let's find ways to be more resilient. Resilient doesn't mean always doing everything, but it is trying to say, where, where are my strengths and how do I push through challenges mm-hmm. to be able to see God's, seek God's glory in the gifts thing that he's given me? Mm-hmm. But it also means I need to pull back in certain places. Where do I do that strategically? Mm-hmm. Because I know that I have limits. Mm-hmm. Um, so we see that in an individual student. But then this gives us an opportunity as a school in assemblies, in mm-hmm. coaching uh, our students, you know, on a team, whatever mm-hmm. that team might be, in various uh, in our chapels, where we can talk about how are, how can we cultivate these things in our lives mm-hmm. so that we might be the sort of people that God wants us to be. So I, I think that happens on the individual level. It happens in advisory. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens in the classroom. It happens beyond the classroom mm-hmm. where we're all beginning to use some more common language mm-hmm. in order to say, this is what we want in you. This BA is dedicated mm-hmm. to providing these sorts of characteristics in you because we see these as the most important. This is what your parents see. These is what our alums see. Like we want you to be successful because you're going to best manifest God's goodness through these things. Mm-hmm. I think that idea of manifesting God, God's goodness in how we live out the day-to-day choices is yeah. such a big part of this. Helping people choose to be a certain way allows them to be willing to give up something to become a certain way. Mm-hmm. You see that in athletics or the fine arts, places where immediate gratification is not possible. Yes. And yeah. it's not desirable either, but it, it's impossible, so you can't choose it. And in the long path of life, it's tempting to look for the immediate result or to measure with the immediate outcomes. And I think some of these conversations are helping us all recognize the outcome is in the life lived well, a long obedience Mm. in the same direction as Eugene Peterson's book titled it, that steps toward the target aren't always linear. It's not always straight toward resilience. Sometimes there's suffering involved that leads to resilience, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the grace that leads to repentance that leads to God's goodness. And so those stages and then looking at these targets as an outcome of stages where we respond well to the different experiences we're having. So talk a little bit about the range of experiences that our students are having academically, socially, and so on, and how just the richness of each individual characteristic individual experience contributes to the learning we get from each other. Yeah. I mean, if we talk about that range, it could be extraordinarily mm-hmm. wide. Right? right. And I, I think about one of the things that I was just having a conversation with somebody right when they come in, one of the things that we want is to be relational. Like mm-hmm. when somebody comes in as a respective family or prospective student, mm-hmm. they, they come in, a, just ran into a, a student who was shadowing yesterday. Who are we? We, we want to be that sort of person that invites them into this mm-hmm. life that's pursuing this portraiture. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I saw it in our students. Like I was in a classroom, there was this the shadow student, and the way in which they were interacting with that student was beginning to exhibit some of these characteristics. Mm-hmm. I was like, ah, oh, this is lovely. Mm-hmm. We have these opportunities as we engage with others. So that's just kind of like on the front end. And then you just think about all the different things that our students are doing. Mm-hmm. Even as simple as choosing classes. 
um, when they're registering for classes and they're trying to figure out where do I strategically invest myself? Where, where is it? How do I find that right um, mm-hmm. use of my time and my energies and my aspirations in order to make wise choices in terms mm-hmm. of the, the wide variety of courses that we offer and the levels at which we offer them? How do I strategically make choices there? How can I do that in community, but then make these choices Mm -hmm. so that I can become who God would have me be? I love that piece. And then you then you have the panoply of other options that you see as students are in the classroom and they're challenged by their teachers. Mm -hmm. Right. The teachers are coming and nurturing and challenging them, but always pushing them. I was just in a meeting, too, that was talking about zone of proximal development, (laughs) like just taking us far enough along. Mm -hmm. So that challenge is there. And that, you know, solving a problem that's within their grasp, but not too far, um, and it, it leading them, that's what our teachers are doing really, really consistently to be able to help shape our students and then providing those opportunities. I, I, when I think about problem solving, one of these things, too, is our teachers being able to say, hey, what is the manifestation of this learning in the real world? What does this look like? How, how, do, how do we apply this? Where would you take this and then be able to, to bring it to the the kitchen table when you you head home and have conversations with your family? Mm-hmm. Or what does it mean to then love your neighbor mm-hmm. through this sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love those awesome, mm-hmm. fantastic opportunities. Additionally, I, I think about all the co-curriculars that we provide where we mm-hmm. tell our students, one of them, body, mind, and spirit, like we want you to be actively in, engaged. You're all in PE or in a sport mm-hmm. and our, our students overwhelmingly are in sport. And, and they're forced to be able to work collaboratively with mm-hmm. somebody else, uh, a team of people towards a particular end. How do we do this? I need to be able to communicate with you effectively so that we can be doing this well. I was watching a soccer game yesterday. It's like, how do they know where the other person is and moving off the ball? Well, that requires coordination and, and communication to be able to do this, to be more successful towards mm-hmm. that end. Mm-hmm. They're all learning this. And then they bring it back into the classroom. Mm-hmm. They have to engage in a group project to be able to talk through things to, to solve a problem, to think more critically about an idea. And then they, then they repeat that, you know, mm-hmm. in the classroom, out of the classroom, with their neighbors, with their friends, with their parents. Mm-hmm. All these pieces come together. Um, one additional piece that I'd, I'd love to bring in is is just talking about like the the way in which we want our parents to be able to see this, mm-hmm. not just the way in which we're doing it, but the way in which they can then adopt this language mm-hmm. in talking with their child about mm-hmm. their own development. It's like how how are you seeing yourself as a critical thinker? How are you being a thoughtful communicator? How are you being a Christ follower through what you're learning at BA? Mm-hmm. And as families are asking these questions and we get to develop these things in coordination with them, I think it becomes a a rich Mm -hmm. environment for that back and forth as we're all saying, this is what we want. This is what we want our child to be. I think that partnership is so important and being able to talk about with this common language to be able to articulate the significance using similar conversations uh, is an important part of helping our kids take on the responsibility for the aspirations we have for them. Mm-hmm. Neither mm-hmm. the parents nor the teachers want to be making decisions for their children uh, right. 10 years from now. They want the students to take that on. And I think the conversations around these portrait pieces, the these structures that lead to certain outcomes in life, give the students the opportunity to take that on for themselves so we can nurture we can challenge but in the end responsibility for your learning ought to be with you Mm. and so helping students understand i'm the one who needs to choose to grow into the person god wants me to be others can impose certain requirements participation in the classroom participation in sports or participation in the arts whatever it might be but at some point The purpose of all that is to equip you to choose well, not just to have experienced the things we chose for you. And I love the conversations that grow out of how we're partnering with parents to develop their children to the place where we turn them loose. The graduation image that we have been using for many, many years is that the faculty lead the students in to the commencement ceremony. But at the end, after we say... You know, congratulations, the alumni of the class of 2023, and the crowd goes wild. Right. Uh, then the students walk out, and they're no longer following us. And so that the intentional approach mm-hmm. of handing responsibility 
for the choices they're making to the students and then uh, equipping them to take on that responsibility. That's the task first and foremost for parents. But I love the fact that in partnership with us, they're envisioning the same sorts of outcomes, a wholeness and a depth spiritually, a richness to their intellect, their ability to engage and respond, to choose well. You know, I, yeah. I think that Joshua 24, 15, you got to choose this day yeah, whom you're going to serve. serve. Uh, a flashback to a comment you made earlier about being relational. When Bill Brown called me on the phone 1999 to introduce the concept of Brentwood Academy to me, I asked him, "What? tell me about Brentwood Academy. What's it all about? And he said, a gentle, humble man that he is, he said, it's very relational. And what does that mean in real life? You <laughs> hug a lot or you know, I've, I've said that yeah. many years. Uh, but what it means is the valuing of each person made in the image of God, the recognition that our interactions count and help us grow into the person God wants us to be, that there's nothing insignificant about what goes on. And even the confidence that God's at work in all the parts and pieces, the struggles, the failures, the things we do well, God's at work accomplishing His purposes, mm -hmm. which sometimes aren't clear to us in the middle of some of the challenging situations. But I just really love the fact that over the history of the school, through Bill Brown's leadership and through the early founding parents and the faculty who stepped out here when there was no security, no fancy buildings, no great programs to rest on, just trusting that God had something going on here. And and I just I reflect on mm. Bill's another great line from Bill Brown, the founding headmaster. Let's see what God does with this. Right, right. And so that certainty uh, just plays such a large part as we talk about uh, the mission of the school, nurturing and challenging each whole person to the glory of God, and then articulating the outcomes. What would it look like if we actually accomplish this? I want to take a minute just to reflect in a few words or sentences. What is each of those words mean? What does resiliency mean? What does it mean to be a critical thinker and so on? So let's start. Resilient. What does it mean to be resilient? I think you've said it best. So I'd love for you to take this one because when we've talked about this before, I think you had a really nice, concise definition. I don't, I don't know if I have to give credit to the songwriter. It's not just I got knocked down, I get up again. Right, right. <laughs> but the ability to thrive under adverse circumstances, yes. Dr. Stephen Glenn, many years ago when I was a young teacher, uh, used that phrase and it stuck with me ever since. The ability to thrive under adverse circumstances, not just mm -hmm. survive, not just able to throw yourself back into the fray, but really equipped in the middle of hard circumstances or sometimes even more threatening to our uh, well-being, those successful times when mm -hmm. you're tempted to focus on something other than depending on God. So I think that's a that's a way that I think captures this. So we want our students to be prepared for what is going to face them in the world ahead, and that means being able to thrive under adverse conditions. And let me just give an example of one of the mm -hmm. things that we're striving to do with that. Um, it, when we go into exams, many times that's what students fear the most, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the semester, it's like this, oh, no, I have this, mm -hmm. this large exam. How am I going to perform on this? Getting our students to metacognitively reflect on the back end mm -hmm. and say, oh, what did I do to prepare for this? Mm -hmm. How successful was I? And then where did I do my preparation well? Mm -hmm. And where could I improve the next time? Mm -hmm. Because this sort of like, oh, I, I get knocked down, get back up again, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. But like, how can I do this better mm -hmm. next time? Because I, I want to be able to thrive under hard circumstance. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to have more exams. I'm going to have more challenges, deadlines, whatever it might mm -hmm. be in life as I go through. So how can I purposefully stop, pause, reflect mm -hmm. during a hard time and say, what did I learn from this? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that's one of the things we're striving to do mm -hmm. as we're like, oh, I think we can we can harness this idea to make mm -hmm. us more the sort of people we want to be post-BA in mm -hmm. college and beyond. Yeah, thanks. Critical thinker. Critical thinker. Man, I, I think one of the things that is so important here is going beyond just the surface. Uh, one of the things that I've seen a lot of excellent educators do is ask like three levels of questions. I don't want just my first response. Mm -hmm. I want to keep on asking why, why, why. 
So mm-hmm. being able to analyze and define a situation and then think about that situation mm-hmm. in order to think from and with that information. Mm-hmm. So the critical piece is taking it deeper, going deeper, mm-hmm. deeper, deeper, more understanding, mm-hmm. not just being content with my first response, sort of like writing a, a rough draft of an essay. I should never be content with that. So if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna really look at this, I'm gonna analyze this, I need to continue to go further than I went initially. Mm-hmm. I have thought often about the idea that we don't really know what we think until we say it, mm. lay it out there and have a chance to look at it ourselves and let somebody else look at that. And then that interaction allows us to refine or enrich the way we're thinking or what we're thinking about. So I love that second question, the third question. Someone said early in my career, uh, the most important question you can ask as a teacher is, and he leaned in closer, what's going on in there? Right, right. <laughs> you know? And so yeah. just to pull out some engagement with an idea that allows you to enrich the thinking, to develop the idea, to interact and learn to engage with that mm-hmm. uh, other person's idea to help clarify your thoughts or sometimes to change your thoughts. And so I think that's really a valuable, important. It leads to the thoughtful I was about to say the, piece, the, the, which the synthesis is such there. an important part of the learning process. Talk a little bit about that, how, how we, that ties We had an excellent conversation with the faculty about this as we recognize the breadth of that idea mm-hmm. by putting that adjective in there and saying thoughtful. Mm-hmm. It, it's beyond just what we're doing right now, but it's, it's how do we go about it? Mm-hmm. You know, what are, what are we doing as we communicate? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not just trying to be a rhetorician. Um, I, I don't, you know, like a, a lot of the Greeks argued against, like I, mm-hmm. I don't want to just be somebody who persuades people to, to mm-hmm. towards that end because that could be used maliciously, right? right. But I want to be the sort of person who ultimately leads towards the flourishing of others. Mm-hmm. So what, is, what does that look like? Well, I, I have to be able to think well, and that's mm-hmm. kind of the priorities or the, the way in which we align these, mm-hmm. like a, that critical thinking. But then how do I communicate that? Mm-hmm. Um, just in advisory uh, last week, um, they were talking about the importance of verbal, nonverbal communication. Mm-hmm. Like, so communication can come in many different forms, but how do I do this in a way that I love my neighbor? I really, really show that care and compassion mm-hmm. and care f- and in the way in which I communicate. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just talking my, with my students as we were diving into a really contentious topic. It's like, we don't want to just win an argument. We want to win the person. Mm-hmm. Like we want to care for the person. Like yeah. how do I do that all the while arguing effectively for my mm-hmm. point? Yeah. But my the point isn't to win an mm-hmm. argument. The point is to win the person over mm-hmm as I talk about this sort of thing. So we, we want uh, kind of this interplay of communication to take in all these different aspects because we want to be a sort, a sort of mm-hmm. person that proclaims the, the truth, beauty, and goodness of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And that, that's thoughtful. Yeah. You use the term in the critical thinking, I think discernment is a part of that. You talked about logic. You've used the term kindness in the context of thoughtful communicator. Yeah. I think that's such a, an awareness of the other, the yeah. person who's receiving the communication, a sensitivity to what that other person's thinking or going through. Uh, again, not just to win the argument, but to care for the person or to acknowledge that the person's value isn't resting in the agreement or the conclusion of the discussion. Right. So that was really powerful. Yeah. When you think about problem solver, obviously these parts and pieces mesh because you have to have certain skills to engage. You have to have a certain bit of uh, gumption, character, resilience to dive into difficult situations. But talk about problem solving as it relates to the choice to take on a problem as well as the ability to come up with a way to handle the problem Mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. Some of this is being led by our teachers as they're looking at the learning, the, the curriculum, and they're looking at, at what they want the students to be able to, those objectives that they want at the mm-hmm. end of the course, framing it in terms of a question. Mm-hmm. You know, it, like think of language acquisition or, or world language. I'm, I'm gonna learn French. Well, to what end? Mm. Like, wh- why am I doing this? How is it that this now opens up a whole world of people that I can engage with mm-hmm. and be able to serve and bless and be a, a neighbor to? 
And if I understand them and their language and the peculiarities of that language and their culture, I'm going to be able to do that much more effectively. So it's even kind of the setting up the problem mm -hmm. that makes the learning even more interesting and engaging. And that's like, oh, how could I, if I'm, if I'm going to be uh, somebody who learns French, then how, how do I do this effectively? And not mm -hmm. just knowing French, but being the sort of person who can then effectively mm -hmm. engage with somebody who's mm -hmm. French, understanding the intricacies and, and maybe idiosyncrasies of that language and that culture. Mm -hmm. I think that's really fascinating. You talked about already math, but we talk about any of these disciplines, almost all of these, the reasons we study these things is because we're solving a problem of mm -hmm. sorts. It's a problem of knowledge and then it's a problem of application of that knowledge. And if we can be looking at learning as solving real problems, yeah. having real audiences, and when we go about this, it becomes really exciting mm -hmm. that the learning isn't something just esoteric, mm -hmm. but it, it's towards a particular end. Mm -hmm. And then for students to be able to recognize, and I think this is one of the things that when we think about the triangle philosophy that it manifests itself so readily, is that it's, it's not an individual endeavor. Sometimes I do need to solve a problem by myself, mm -hmm. but more often than not, I, I do it mm -hmm. in conjunction with others. So in the classroom, I'm teaming up with somebody to be able to solve something on the court, in the field, mm -hmm. on, you know, whatever it might be mm -hmm. in the pool. I'm, I'm doing this with other people mm -hmm. because we want to solve a problem. We want to win this game. We want to win this mm -hmm. tournament. We want to, you know, be able to, to win the trophy. How do, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. We're going to synchronistically do this much better, mm -hmm. um, synergistically do this much better mm -hmm. together than I, I could do it individually. I think that applies beautifully in the classroom. You think of the AP exam, calculus. I have to add, what language does God speak? Calculus, <laughs> just in case any of our listeners haven't found that out yet. But so many relationships can only be expressed by calculus. But clearly, that's a little clearly, right, aside yeah. there. But you know, in the classroom, if the team, if the class can agree, we're, it's us against uh, the exam, not the teacher against the student. Right, it's us right. against the exam. We're trying to accomplish something together. That's one element of this. And I think it's, it's wonderful when you do have a sense of being in something together, going through difficulties together, that there's a mm -hmm. unity and, and it's something where you're supported and can encourage each other in the process. I think there's an element, too, where difficulties are relational in a different way. Sometimes, yes, right. or many times, it's the difficulty is the person. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm causing the problem, or the tension is between two people, and you can't resolve that unilaterally, generally speaking. In yeah. other words, yeah. if I have an offense against you, I've got to go to you and say, here's what is a problem mm -hmm. for me. Either to say, forgive me for the part I'm playing in that, or to ask you, will you be willing to talk with me and help resolve this, this issue? And so I think that, again, the willingness, what does it take to develop in ourselves the confidence that we're able to handle the awkwardness of admitting that there's a problem? Mm -hmm. you know, our tendencies typically are to try to look like we're okay. And admitting there's a problem acknowledges I'm not entirely okay just now yeah. and yeah. that I need help in fixing yeah. this. And so that sense of community and the, this idea of, of being able to interact with other people in a way that leads toward something that God's doing, leads toward a unity that can only be explained by God at work. And that, that leads us naturally into this last of our characteristics, mm -hmm. a Christ follower. We don't require parents to believe in Christ, to be following Christ as their Savior. We don't require students to do that. We don't pressure students to sign on a dotted line or to go through some sort of acceptance ceremony. We offer an invitation to recognize the claims God has on our lives and then to choose how to respond to that. And so just think about what Christ follower means in the context of the long view. Again, I said earlier, it's not that we're pretending that everyone's halo is straight at graduation because of us or anything like that, but right, God at right. work, uh, what does it look like to have this as an aspiration that every one of our graduates would be following Christ? Yeah. Well, like all these terms, we wrestled with the wording, like what's the right way? And, and I think you articulated the challenge in some ways because we are open enrollment. We, mm -hmm. we want every sort of student to be able to come here, but we also 
want them to see the beauty and the glory of the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't demand it, but we want them to see it. Just like our, our mission statement is everything's to the glory of God. It's mm -hmm. on our doors, right? That's what we're striving mm -hmm. for. We want people to be able to catch the beauty of that. Mm -hmm. So that, that happens in every single aspect of who we are. And we're unapologetic about that because we believe God really is the answer. Mm -hmm. He really is the way, the truth, and the life. And we want people to recognize that. So they don't need to see it right now, but it is our hope aspirationally mm -hmm. that at some point that they would become a Christ follower because that's where life is. Mm -hmm. It's where true depth, beauty, and life is. And that sort of fulfillment and hope and peace that we get from walking with God, we want that for all of our students. Mm -hmm. So we want to point to that. And yes, that does happen in our Bible classes. And yes, that does happen in chapel. Mm -hmm. But that also happens in our anatomy classes and it happens in you know our art classes that everything is pointing in that same direction and it's pointing through the relationships mm -hmm. and the the interactions that they have with our, our staff and our faculty who are all christians who are christ followers but in this community mm -hmm. uh, you even mentioned earlier you know like the the challenge sometimes of working interpersonally we learn through the humility of others like oh this person really exemplifies christ mm -hmm. he, he or she points me to Christ. We want to have a community that does that, mm. that, that exemplifies Christ in everything so that our students who come in as Christians grow in discipleship. They're Christ followers and they're deeper and richer into the life of Christ mm -hmm. and the community of Christians together. So that's one side. But then for the student who comes in who doesn't know Christ and the family that doesn't, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But we want them to be able to see like, oh, this, this is beautiful, like this is rich, this is deep. Mm -hmm. And they should be able to see that in everything that we've described thus far. I think seeing that in all of its richness, seeing us in our imperfections and our mm -hmm. need for a savior yeah. helps make it acceptable, or just easier to accept the fact that you're not a different person if you're a sinner, you're like us. Right. And those conversations, <laughs> think emerge with real clarity when people see us as imperfect too, that we're willing mm -hmm. to acknowledge mm -hmm. I need forgiveness. There are places where I need to go Absolutely. and interact with other of my peers. And when parents exemplify that as well, to live out those moments of humility and acceptance of God's forgiveness and God's grace, to recognize that discipline is a form of God's grace, not the opposite of grace. For example, as parents discipline children and so on, it's the love of the parent that makes the parent hold the child accountable and mm -hmm. guide them and give correction and so on. So this this whole pattern that God's put in place of how people are led toward an understanding of God's authority and are not living up to the standard of perfection that he sets, and then the fact that by God's grace, while we were yet all sinners, needed, right? Christ all died needed. for us. And it's just, yep. there's such a richness to that. Uh, you may, said something earlier, just as some graduate and don't, uh, are not yet believers. It's been so enriching to hear testimonies of students who came for the arts or came for an athletic event or came for something that they aspired to academically and found Christ here. And mm -hmm. I've just, over the years that I've been here, 23 and a half now, uh, to hear people tell that story of their experience because some teacher, or in some cases, another parent who took them to their kitchen table and led them to Christ, uh, that that positioning that God does in his timing to allow people to offer hope and then to see those seeds bear fruit years mm -hmm. after the fact. Mm -hmm. I'm so uh, cautious about claiming credit for anything that God's doing. You know, he gives right. us an opportunity to be a part of what he's up to, but it's not because of us that people come to faith. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts. It gives us an opportunity, though, to point people to Christ and to be bold about sharing that hope that we have. And so it's an invitation. Come follow Christ. We're following Christ. Come follow him with us. And I think that caps the, the, the mission statement best, that is for God's glory and God's purposes to lift up Christ and to see the life of Christ lived out through his church, through the people who are following him here. It's been exhilarating to see the conversations, to see the richness of the outgrowth of those as we think about the mission statement dedicated to nurturing and challenging each whole person, body, mind, and spirit to the glory of God. And then yeah. to think and trust God that he's going to use these five characteristics as we continue to expand on those uh, to help us continue to focus and to aim toward that target for his glory. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I think that this environment, it, like Christ does the work constantly, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit's working through us, but we want to be able to cultivate an environment where all these characteristics become, uh, is the fertile soil in which they can, mm -hmm. can grow. Yeah. yeah, thanks for your leadership in helping us craft the wording. It's been really productive. Well, it's been such a joy teaming together and working on this and then now being able to see it manifest itself. It's great. Now that you know a little bit more about the implementation of Portrait of a Graduate, be sure to listen to the next five episodes where we dig a little deeper into each trait. Next up, school counselor Alyssa Hall joins Mr. Masters to talk about being resilient.